Hello everybody, welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host Ricardo Lopes and today I'm joined by Dr. Edward Hagen. He is Professor of Evolutionary Anthropology at Washington State University in the US. His research takes an evolutionary approach to non-infectious diseases with a focus on mental health. He investigates tobacco use in the larger context of human use of plant secondary compounds. He investigates depression, suicide and deliberate self-harm as potential signaling strategies. Child growth and development is a research theme sorry, that grew out of his work on postpartum depression. He has also recently begun testing evolutionary models of leadership as part of his more inter general interest in the evolution of human social organization. Finally, he has published a, a number of theoretical papers on evolutionary approaches to ontogeny, cognition, and behavior. So, Dr. Hagen, thank you a lot for taking the time to come on the show. It's a real pleasure to everyone. Glad to be here. Okay, great. So, I mean, it's interesting that uh, we're going to talk today about uh, mental illnesses, uh, generally speaking, from an anthropological perspective, because I guess that most people, when they hear about mental illness, they would associate them with, or they would think that they would fall within the purview of disciplines like psychiatry or psychology or clinical psychology more specifically. So, I mean, the first question I would like to ask you is, uh, how and why can anthropology give us insights into how mental illnesses work? Well, <clears throat> I decided to pursue anthropology uh, because I felt that to truly get a handle on mental illnesses and mental health, that we needed a pan-species and pan-cultural perspective. And we really didn't see that in, and we still don't, in psychiatry and psychology. Um, <clears throat> a lot of psychiatry does use model species, like uh, mouse models to test antidepressants um, or other laboratory animals. But they don't really think about those animals in terms of their evolutionary ecology. Um, they really just view them as kind of generic mammalian brains that they can test um, in, you know, forced swim test or something like that. So I really thought we really need to consider the full range of human diversity, the full range of cultural diversity, and we really need to take a, a long evolutionary perspective to to really begin to try and understand what these things are. And I thought that um, evolutionary anthropology would be the, the best discipline to, to tackle this issue from that perspective. Mm -hmm. So you are trying to understand the evolutionary basis of these kinds of behavior, like for example, uh, depression, self-harm, suicide, uh, delusional disorder, and uh, I, I mean subst and substance consume and uh, consumption and other things like that, right? Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And why do you think that, uh, or what do you think an evolutionary perspective can add to the picture that we can't get from just studying mental illness uh, in the lab or in a psychiatric or psychological uh, context? Well, I think it remains to be seen. So um, I think evolutionary perspective has generated a lot of interesting ideas. Um, none of them um, have really led to dramatically improved treatments or anything like that. So it's, it's very early days. But um, I think one of the perspectives that we do see in some research in psychiatry and clinical psychology, but which is really core to an evolutionary approach, is um, inter-individual conflicts of interest. Mm -hmm. that conflicts of interest are really, um, and individual competition are really central to evolutionary theory, that organisms are evolving because um, they have traits that allow them to 
outcompete out members of their own species for access to resources, access to mates. And that dimension, I think, if you look at the data, is really central to a lot of these mental health conditions that if you dig beneath the surface a little bit, you really see that they're embedded in social conflict. Um, and usually with really important other individuals in their environment, their mates, their parents, their offspring, um, their important social partners. And so I think one of the key insights of an evolutionary approach is um, that we evolutionary biologists and evolutionary social scientists are really used to thinking about um, the uh, functional significance or strategic significance of behaviors in situations of intense conflict. And we, I think, have a perspective on conflict that you, um, isn't really appreciated in psychiatry um, and psychology generally. So I think that might be one of the main um, advantages. I think a second advantage would be the comparative approach that we can kind of step back and say, do we see behaviors like this in other species? And if so, why? And if not, why not? Um, so we have a whole set of tools that we can bring to the problem that are not available in psychiatry and psychology generally. Although, to be fair, there are um, psychiatrists like Randy Nessie and clinical psychologists um, that are doing the same thing I'm doing. So there, there is kind of a, a ragtag <laughs> a uh, bunch of, uh, of evolutionary folks interested in evolutionary medicine who who do have the same toolkit that I do and are, are applying them to the same kind of problems. Sometimes coming to the very similar conclusions, other times um, pretty different ones. Mm -hmm. So hopefully later on in the interview we, we are going to talk about things like signaling theory, the bargaining model, the inclusive fitness model applied to specific uh, behaviors or mental conditions. So, I mean, it's interesting that you've just referred to the importance of the social aspect of, of human behavior, or at least putting these mental illnesses in a social context to understand them better, because, I mean, there are several different approaches to mental illnesses, of course, but many of them seem to center a lot on the individual in terms of trying to find something that is wrong with a particular person's brain, some chemical imbalance, uh, some malfunctioning of some sort or something like that. So, uh, I mean, uh, you, do you think that uh, in order to better understand mental illness, we really have to go beyond that more uh, individualistic and perhaps uh, cerebral-centered approach to, to mental illness and also include the social context of the individual? I do think so. I, I think in some cases uh, an individual-centered approach is probably appropriate. So if we think about dysfunctions in other parts of the body, um, they may not really have a strong social component. Um, and there'll be clear cases like things like Alzheimer's, yeah. Um, and um, maybe other things like autism, of course, these may involve dysfunctions of social cognitive mechanisms, but they may or may not, it's a little you know, unclear still, but they may not really have a heavy environmental component. And so the, the more individual-centered approach might be more appropriate um, in some cases, but in other cases like depression um, and anxiety um, and uh, suicidality, um, I think the evidence that the social environment is causally involved somehow is just overwhelming. Um, if you look at the major risk factors for depression, um, marital conflict, divorce, physical assault, all of these things involve other folks in your social environment, um, folks who are really, uh, from an evolutionary perspective, would, uh, are extremely important to your fitness. Um, and often involving conflicts with those folks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah, we really do need to bring in, I think in some of these cases, um, and we really need to question, is it, you know, is this kind of mental disease model really appropriate? Or in some cases, are we really looking at social strategies as folks interact with 
other individuals in their environments, um, often in conflictual settings. Mm -hmm. I understand. So one of the things that I read about in your work is the constructive theory of mental illnesses. Could you tell us what that is about and um, how you apply it to, for example, delusional disorder? Um, I don't remember using that phrase, although I probably did. <laughs> so I'm not quite sure what it refers to. Um, the delusional disorder paper was my master's thesis, so I, oh, I wrote okay, that okay, okay. back in the <laughs> back in the 1990s. Um, so my memory of it is a little bit fuzzy. I did I did flip through it quickly this morning to to kind of remind myself. But I think um, what you might be referring to there is is me. Um, a lot of folks have pointed out that there have been some really severe critics of psychiatry, like Thomas Saz, yeah. and um, folks wondered, am I going, to, you know, is my work really going down the same path? Um, mm -hmm. So I read up on Saz, and yeah, we did have a lot of overlap in our thinking that uh, a lot of times we are classifying behaviors as illnesses because they're socially undesirable, and we want to suppress them. Um, so that was his kind of Saz's critical uh, approach, but he also had a constructive approach. I think this is what you might be getting at there, yeah. where if these things aren't mental illnesses, what are they? Yeah. Um, and um, you know, long before uh, I started working in this area, or you know, I was probably still in elementary school. <laughs> Saz is putting forward um, substantive, constructive theories that of what these things are um, that might compete with the illness model, um, and he kind of puts forward that some of these are essentially lying. Um, it may be sort of um, politically incorrect to think of folks that are suffering, you know, what seem to be severe mental illnesses as liars, yeah. um, but Saz is arguing that these guys are, you know, deeply engaged with their lives, and in that particular context, um, being deceptive might be um, the best strategy for them. So, and that had some overlap, maybe we'll, we'll probably get into this a little bit later, with some of the signaling ideas that I was talking about, deceptive signaling. Yeah. Um, so, really, I'm tipping my hat to, uh, to Saz here as, as a forerunner of a, of a lot of the ideas that um, I'm also engaged with. Mm -hmm. And so, you still hold on to this view, to this kind of view of perhaps uh, some some of in some of the cases we classify things as mental illnesses uh, just because we think of them as deviant behavior or because they don't really go well uh, with our cultural context or something like that and then also perhaps that um, sometimes it's not really an illness, it's just something else like people lying or something like that, or, or even using um, some strategies that we know from a biological perspective, like deception, uh, even sometimes perhaps self-deception even, and right. things like that. Yeah, I, I would say, I, I hesitate to use the word belief because I, I think these ideas are solid hypotheses, but I don't think that I've come close to <laughs> or that anyone else is proving any of them. There really is no theory of ent any mental illness that has been, has reached anything like a consensus. Um, and I certainly put my, my own ideas in that vein. So I, I certainly do think that um, we do need to consider a broader range of hypotheses, um, including ones that step outside of an illness model. And I also think that we still face huge mysteries in understanding ourselves. And so each of us kind of has an intuitive um, understanding of what we think is normal behavior and what is abnormal behavior. But when we then try and uh, put that in a scientific framework, um, can we really be confident that we really understand enough about humans to confidently say this is uh, dysfunctional behavior, illness behavior, um, and then this is not strategic behavior? Um, and I don't think we do. And you said something that seemed to sort of allude to maybe a mismatch hypothesis, which might be true in some cases that we're 
currently living in a modern environment that, that differs pretty dramatically from the ancestral environment. I think that is one another contribution of an evolutionary approach is it brings in the mismatch idea, which I think is a powerful idea. Um, but a lot of times I think, um, and again, here's where I, again, sort of tip my hat to Saz, that um, there's a lot of these behaviors, you know, things like we, there's a lot of behaviors that we want to socially control because they're not convenient for us. Um, and so, and I think sometimes some of the behaviors and phenomena that we classify as mental illness are exactly those behaviors that are uh, just happen to not be convenient for folks in power and they do have a strong interest in um, suppressing them. Just to give a quick example there, mm -hmm. there's a huge literature on um, depression, work-related depression, depression uh, at work. Um, and again, you think, and then what the literature is showing, I mean, it's just overwhelming evidence that at least from the depressed person's perspective, the reason they're depressed is um, that they are in an exploitative work environment where their work is not valued or they don't have decision authority. Um, they're kind of treated like a robot or a machine. Um, and yet we treat depression as if it's a problem with the employee, not with their working conditions. Yeah. And so, um, and whose interest is, is that for that employee to not be depressed? It's clearly in the interest of the employer to view the employee's depression as not related to exploited working conditions, but as some kind of problem with the employee. Um, and so, and you see this in paper after paper after paper, making the business case for depression research and antidepressant use. It's really to get these poor depressed workers from to not be depressed and increase their productivity. Um, and you don't see anywhere in the literature any concern that the environment actually might be exploitative of the workers. And so this would be a situation where I would argue we really need to consider that uh, there's nothing wrong with the employee and they don't have a mental illness at all, that they're uh, having uh, an adaptive and functional response to an exploitative environment. And there's a a huge amount of uh, evidence that that is in fact the case. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's very interesting. Uh, there's a thing that just came to my mind, uh, thinking about the cultural context and uh, the fact that we deem some behaviors as, or we classify them as mental illnesses just because uh, society don't want, don't, doesn't want to deal with it or exactly. it's, or it's harm for, for society in general in some way. And uh, let me ask you, I, I don't know what is your position on group selection or cultural group selection, but when it comes, for example, to suicide, uh, I know that Thomas has... Uh, had a sort of a defense of suicide. He said, I guess, that there were at least some instances where it was rational for the individual to commit suicide. But uh, I was just thinking that perhaps from a group selection or a cultural group selection, not necessarily a genetic one, maybe it would uh, be favorable to the group to um, to disfavor suicide, right? I mean, to, to to just not promote that kind of idea that people should have their freedom to commit suicide if they want, if they if they suffer enough and they don't want to live anymore or, or something like that. So, uh, I, I mean, I don't know if you want to comment on this. It's just sure. something that came to my mind. We don't really need, I, I think they're, um, I think you're exactly right that uh, folks, um, that society, if you will, um, there's a lot of folks in any social group that would have a strong interest in preventing and deterring and discouraging suicidal behavior. Um, and I don't think we need a, a group selectionist perspective necessarily to account for that, depending, I mean, I don't have any problem with multi-level selection, so if you want to take a multi-level approach, fine with me. But if you want to take an individual level and kinship-based approach, uh, same thing. Um, and just to give an example, kind of our, our paradigmatic example is that um, 
we first of all we see empirically that um, suicide attempts vastly outnumber suicide completions. So if you look at suicidal, the, the range of suicidal behaviors, plans, thoughts, threats, attempts, um, these are extremely common um, and they, they vastly outnumber suicide completions. So our basic approach is that if suicidality is an adaptation, um, it's going to be uh, one of these non-lethal uh, types of behaviors like a threat or an attempt, an attempt that is made with relatively low probability of success. And it's not the completion. We, we view the completions as accidental outcomes of what was uh, meant to be a suicide threat or a suicide attempt. Um, but we, we draw on costly signaling theories. These signals are taking place, we argue, in situations of severe social conflict. And one of the standard situations that we see in the ethnographic record, and this is research by my graduate student, Kristen Syme, is that um, forced marriages are an extremely common um, trigger for suicidal threats and suicide attempts. So you have a young woman um, her family or relatives want to marry her off to some guy that she finds very unattractive. Um, she might be in love with um, the cute guy next door. Or, and when she is forced to marry someone that she doesn't want to, um, we very commonly see um, threats or, of suicide or suicide attempts. And um, we're arguing that that is a bargaining strategy, that that is her way of saying, if you're going to force me to do this, I'm going, you get a lot of value from marrying me off to this guy. You form an alliance between two families. Maybe he's got, he's got a lot of money, he's wealthy, or he's got a lot of political power. And so the community gets a lot of benefits from that marriage. But if the marriage is not in the interest of, let's say, you know, this 15 or 16 year old girl, what power does she have to go against her family um, and her parents and the community at large, she doesn't have much power, except she does have power over her own life. And she can say, if you marry me, I'm gonna kill myself and you will not get all of those benefits from the marriage. Um, and so then to get back to your point of when would society have an interest in suppressing suicidal behavior, it's right there. Because they want to get the benefits of marrying off the girl to uh, some politically convenient um, family, mm -hmm. and for them, her suicide attempt is thwarting their political strategies. Um, so I can see a lot of cases where social norms would develop culturally to really try and suppress suicidal behavior because we view it as a way for powerless individuals to um, exert power and perhaps um, get the social contract to be renegotiated in their favor. Maybe the family can figure out someone else that she could marry that she finds attractive, but also might um, at least serve some of their political interests as well. So we kind of view the suicidality as this bargaining strategy back and forth, back and forth, with a suicide completion being a very unfortunate and unintended outcome of this high stakes bargaining strategy. Okay. Um, uh, and so this is the bargaining model, right? And this connects also with or goes associated with signaling theory in terms of it being a costly and honest signal, right? Yeah, because we can imagine, let's say the young girl, um, let's say they arrange a marriage for her and Actually, she does kind of like the guy. She she kind of, but she wants more. Um, so she could, you know, we have agents that uh, are self interested, and um, the family has their interests, and the young woman has her interests. Um, so how does the family know that she really doesn't find that this marriage is really not in her interest, versus her just angling for um, a bigger wedding or or something? Um, and so there's an inherent conflict of interest between, um, let's say, the daughter and her parents over uh, uh, a mateship. 
And how can the daughter credibly signal that this guy genuinely is a bad match for her? Um, and we use costly signaling theory here, which is, um, as probably most of your listeners know, is a way for agents to credibly signal an internal state in situations where there are incentives to um, deceive. And in this case, how does it work? Um, if this was actually a good marriage for the young woman and she was just trying to, let's say, angle for a bigger dowry or, or something like this, bigger bride price, let me put it that way, um, or a bigger wedding, um, then she could not afford to put her own life at risk because she has to do something in our theory that genuinely puts her life at risk. Um, let's say a 1% or a 2% chance of actually dying. Um, if her life is really going well, if this is actually a good thing for her, she can't afford to engage in suicidal behavior um, because the outcome um, for her is the, the costs of that don't outweigh the benefits. But let's say that this guy is actually is a bad match for the woman. Yeah. Um, in that case, she's kind of indifferent between going through with the marriage and not living at all. Um, and so for her, the cost of a suicide attempt is quite low. Um, and so by the fact of her actually engaging in suicidal behavior, that's a credible signal that the current situation is actually has very low, um, few fitness benefits for her. Um, and therefore it reveals her private valuation of the marriage, that her valuation of it is extremely low. And under our theory anyway, the parents would then realize, yeah, that this really is a bad match. She's not trying to manipulate us. She's not being deceptive. And we really should think about um, letting her marry someone else. So um, it's a way of, for powerless people to, I um, mean, we kind of view it kind of like a labor strike. Um, you, the workers have a lot of value to in their employer. And if they go on strike, the employer can't get the value out of the employee, and that gives an incentive to the employer to cut the employees a better deal. Um, and we view the same thing going on here with suicidality and also depression. Um, that if a person is ending up, if, if their social partners, their parents, their community is kind of cutting them a bad deal, they can put their own value to the community at risk um, and in uh, hopes of getting a fair uh, deal for them. Mm -hmm. So this is the bargaining model. Does this model apply to all instances of suicidal behavior or is it the case that perhaps it applies to some and then there are other models that explain suicidal behavior in other instances? Because, for example, I know that there are uh, other models that have been proposed, like, for example, the inclusive fitness model, right? So That's right. How, how, how does it work exactly? Yeah, so if you look at the full range of suicidal behavior, um, the vast majority of it is non-lethal. And so we think that the signaling model or the bargaining model um, probably applies to most suicidal behavior that is non-lethal, including um, the vast majority of attempts that are non-lethal. Because it's really, it's not that hard to kill yourself if you really... If you're determined to do it, find a tall building, find a cliff, uh, get a gun. There, it's, it's, especially in the modern environments, it's, mm -hmm. it's pretty trivial if, if you genuinely want to kill yourself to do so. So it's striking to us that so much suicidal behavior ends up being non-lethal. Um, however, you're right. There are cases where it is very lethal. And we see this in the ethnographic record as well. And we typically see it with folks who are elderly, infirm. We often see it in Arctic groups, um, like Inuit groups, where folks who are very ill and infirm and unlikely to, um, and actually are imposing a burden on their families, they may actually even ask a family member to um, kill them. Um, so that they don't continue to impose costs on on their family members. So we do see a subset of fairly lethal suicidal behavior, typically in among the elderly and infirm, and often in 
societies living in pretty harsh environments where there isn't a lot of margin to deal with or be able to take care of folks um, who need a lot of, of care to, to just make it to the next day. So you're right, there, there is a, an important subset of behavior that our model does not apply to um, that we see cross-culturally. Um, and that might be better explained by the inclusive fitness model or some other model that where folks really don't want to impose a burden on their families due to their illness or infirmity. Mm -hmm. uh, and that inclusive fitness model, it reminds me of something because, because I've already had Dr. Mark Leary on the show and he developed sociometer theory. And I, I'm, I'm not sure if it was he who applied it directly to try to formulate an explanation for the evolution of suicide and depression and I mean and then it connects with low levels of self-esteem as well because people compare themselves with their uh, kin for example or with their community and they find that they are really of for example no value and they would be better off killing themselves and leaving the more resources to their uh, family for example i mean th does that kind of idea or theory still stand i think it doesn't I, i don't think it's very theoretically coherent from an evolutionary perspective so i agree the there is evidence that folks do exactly that so that would be in favor of the theory that we do see <laughs> We do see behaviors that look exactly like that, um, and those are the reasons that people actually give. Um, but it doesn't, I think, make a lot of evolutionary sense. So I'm skeptical that it would be, let's say, a genetically evolved strategy. And the reason is this, that it's really across all uh, branches of life, um, organisms face the problem of competing for resources with kin. Um, and so why do plants disperse their seeds very widely? It's because they don't want to be competing for sunlight with their offspring. Um, why do 70% of mammals disperse and live solitary lives? They don't want to be competing for access to resources with kin. And so trying to um, avoid competing or imposing costs on kin is a ubiquitous problem um, across almost all species, and the solution that we see over and over and over is dispersal. Walk away. If you're imposing a burden on your kin, you don't need to kill yourself, just leave. Um, or if you can't leave because you're infirm, they can leave. Um, and, and given that humans evolved as nomadic foragers, um, this would have been a very easy solution. And the advantages um, that we see with dispersal is if you think you're imposing a burden on your kin, uh, you can just walk away and leave, and you're no longer imposing a burden on them, but you're also preserving some non-zero probability that you might survive and reproduce still. Mm -hmm. um, and that's exactly the logic behind dispersal. Um, and so I don't see any advantage to killing yourself. Uh, just leave or let your family leave. Um, and then maybe you'll recover, and maybe you'll survive and reproduce, uh, maybe you won't, um, but there's really no added benefit to killing yourself. So I, I don't see the evolutionary logic, um, and this is the inclusive fitness model. Um, I just, they haven't really, I think if, if there is an adaptation for this, it's going to be something more subtle. Um, And it's not going to be something simple like that. And the more subtlety, I, I've kind of just tried to give it some thought because we, I, we do see this pattern, um, at least in some environments where people exactly behave like that. And what it might be, especially, isn't then this is just you know something I haven't given too much thought to, but I've just I've thought about a little bit that um, a lot of political strategies and power in small-scale societies flow from parents to offspring. Um, so you could maybe imagine a situation where um, if you have an elderly leader, yeah. um, as long as he's alive, his sons can't really ascend to power. Um, but his sons may have competitors 
um, that are also vying for leadership positions. Um, and it might be in, in a leader's advantage to kind of choose the time of his death in a way that would be advantageous to his sons as opposed to their competitors in terms of their political strategies. So I could see some subtle, more subtle political strategy here in terms of trying to set things up in the, in the human social context where ancestors play such a huge role in political strategies and political organization um, that there might be some advantage to choosing the time of your death um, and not just let, leaving it to chance. Um, but that's purely speculative and <laughs> unlike everything else I'm saying here, <laughs> that one is really speculative. Uh, uh, and I haven't really worked out exactly how it might work, but maybe maybe something along those lines. Okay, great. So and now let's move on to talk about a little bit about depression. Uh, so we've already referred to the bargaining model and it also applies to depression and anger, right? That's right. Um, and, uh, and again, I might go back to the work-related case. Um, you have an employee, they have an exploitative work environment where the benefits they're getting from work don't exceed their, or actually the, the costs that they, the, the effort they put into the work is greater than what they get back out of it in terms of benefits for themselves. And what we see in, in a labor strike is when, when that happens, um, employees often go on strike. They withhold their labor in an effort to negotiate better, a better deal for themselves. And, but that problem, I think, is not just one in modern um, businesses and corporations. I think it's one that has extended back um, throughout human evolution in the sense that we have always lived in small cooperative cooperatives uh, where folks are cooperating to get food and defend territory. Um, and then those benefits are distributed to members of the group. And um, I think it would have been a ubiquitous problem that the benefits are not distributed in a way that some individuals think is fair. Um, and so what would be a good strategy if you're, um, what you're getting uh, back from the cooperative endeavor um, doesn't pay for the amount of effort you're putting into it? doesn't compensate you. Well, I think just like with the labor strike, um, a good strategy would be to withhold your investment in the cooperative endeavor um, until you get a better deal. And so the bargaining model of depression is that in situations uh, where there is a conflict of interest and where folks are in a situation where they are uh, not getting um, out of the cooperative debt or what they're putting into it, um, they go on strike. And maybe depression um, is the manifestation of that strategy. If you look at folks in a work environment uh, that is exploitive, what their productivity drops. So they experience depression, um, they're not motivated to work, and um, that's exactly uh, what we think is essentially a bargaining strategy or a labor strike strategy. You're, you're doing that, you're withholding your investment until the situation changes uh, for the better for you. Um, and so I think it, it um, and we can, there's many, many situations where this might occur in a marriage where one partner is doing more than the other, yeah. uh, maybe in terms of investing in children um, or whatever it might be, situations where folks are, are not benefiting from a cooperative endeavor may become depressed and withhold their cooperation in order to get a better deal. Um, and we see a lot of evidence that uh, depression is associated with situations of conflict. Um, it does involve a lot of anger, mm -hmm. and um, that would be the flip side of the bargaining strategy. This has um, been put forward by my colleagues Aaron Sell and others, that if you're physically strong, mm -hmm. um, another way to bargain for a better deal is to physically threaten people. Um, and so we kind of view depression and uh, overt anger as two sides of the same coin, uh, you kind of have to assess what resources do I have to negotiate a better deal for myself. In some cases, it might be um, threatening other people physically because I can do so because I'm physically strong. Um, in other cases, it might be withholding 
the investment that you're providing to the cooperative endeavor um, and maybe permanently threatening to do so with a suicide threat or a suicide attempt. Mm -hmm. So that's very interesting. Since you're looking at anger and depression as two sides of the same coin, coin according to the bargaining model, would that help us better understand why we have sex differences in depression and why women tend to suffer more from depression than men? Yeah, so one of uh, my ideas for a long time was that there's a massive sex difference in physical strength and there's also a pretty big sex difference, as you just mentioned, in, um, in depression, that women are twice as likely to get depressed as men. And so I always wondered, is there any association with upper body strength and um, depression? And if we controlled for upper, upper body strength, uh, might the sex difference in depression uh, disappear in a regression model, for example? And um, there's a, uh, a um, biannual uh, health and nutrition survey in the United States called NHANES, and it's a very large representative they take a large representative sample of, uh, of Americans um, in a two-year cycle, and they've always measured depression. So you can really look at the associations of depression with a lot of other health conditions in a nationally representative sample. So it's a really important um, survey. Um, but they started adding grip strength to it um, a few years ago. And so we looked at if, and grip strength is a very good index of upper body strength. Um, and other research has shown that folks that have high grip strength, i.e. high upper body strength, are more likely to get overtly angry, um, to bargain for a better deal for themselves. Um, and so I wondered if we controlled for grip strength, if the sex difference in depression would disappear. And that's exactly what we found, that once you controlled for grip strength, um, there was actually a slight male bias um, in depression, not a female bias. It wasn't significant, but um, the sex difference actually went in the opposite direction. And we were able to show that that was not a confound with other anthropometric measures, other health measures, disabilities, um, socioeconomic status, education, income, all the things that might be confounds, at least that we have in NHANES, um, chronic diseases. Uh, none of those were... Um, a couple of them were slight confounds, but none of them explain the association of, of grip strength with um, sex. So we were pretty excited um, that this is showing that maybe the sex difference in depression is due to the sex difference in upper body strength. Um, and that study went very well. Now, they did the survey again, and I put my student on it to see if we could replicate those results. And I have to say, it looks like um, the replication is not as successful as I would have hoped. We haven't completed the analysis, so I'm not 100% sure what it is. But typical with many, many replications efforts, um, we still saw the positive effect, but our effect sizes were about half as big as in the original study. So I'm not yet uh, willing to say, I, the first study turned out great. Um, our follow-up study is still supportive, it seems, but not as strongly as the original study. So the, um, the jury's still out on that. Okay, so one of the behaviors that sometimes goes associated with self, uh, sorry, with depression is self-harm. So is that another instance of costly signaling? Yeah, we think it might be another instance of costly signaling. If you look at all of the risk factors for self-harm, and this would be things like cutting and, and burning, where folks have cuts on their wrists and stuff, and... Um, they're not necessarily, there's not necessarily a lethal intent there, and some folks have made a big deal out of that, but a lot of the risk factors are very, very similar. Mm -hmm. um, about a third of folks who do that will actually admit that they're essentially signaling, um, trying to get the attention of others that they're in distress. Um, it's a minority of individuals that will admit that, but um, it's a large minority. Um, and we also see that self-harm is a huge risk factor for suicidal behavior later. Um, so we do see it as on a continuum of signaling strategies that might be a costly signaling 
strategy where the costs to individuals who are in genuine need of hurting themselves is relatively low, whereas the cost of signal of uh, of self-harming behaviors for folks who are not in need is quite high. And that's what makes um, self-harming behavior potentially an honest signal of of genuine need. Mm -hmm. I understand. And what about postnatal or postpartum depression? I mean, what's going on there? Well, that was um, my PhD thesis. So that was um, my first work in this area. And um, I had been thinking about the bargaining model of depression a lot, but I hadn't really written anything on it or researched it. And someone challenged me, well, how would the bargaining model explain postpartum depression? And I thought about it for a couple minutes, and I thought, wow, that's a great, it actually explains it perfectly. (laughs) Um, And that would be a really great uh, case uh, study or test case for the bargaining model because in postpartum depression, you have a mother and a father um, heavily investing in a new infant. Mm-hmm. And so that's the cooperative endeavor. And you can easily imagine that one or the other of them might feel that they're investing more than their partner. Um, and that this might be um, having a negative impact on their biological fitness, not that anybody's consciously thinking that, but those would be the selective forces at work at here. Um, and when I dug into the literature on postpartum depression, there was just overwhelming evidence that it was um, associated with and probably caused by, um, at least in part, one of the biggest risk factors or set of risk factors. Um, in fact, the biggest risk factor, I would say, was, was child care stress of various sorts. And one of the biggest sources of child care stress was um, lack of support from the husband. Um, and so if husbands weren't investing or they were absent or there was conflict in the marriage, um, these were hugely strong risk factors for postpartum depression in mothers. Yeah. Um, we also saw that poor infant health uh, was a big risk factor and poor mother health was a big risk factor. So these are all um, things that are just falling right out of um, parental investment theory, where especially in humans, human infants require a massive amount of investment from both parents, directly or indirectly. And if that investment isn't there, um, it might not be in a mother's interest to continue investing in the infant. But of course, without the mother, that infant's not going to make it. So she has a lot of power to negotiate a better deal for herself by really demonstrating that um, if the father or other family members don't step up, um, she's not going to continue investing in this infant. And um, none of this is is conscious and none of it is pleasant. The mothers feel horrible that they don't love their infants. Um, They want to care for them, but they can't. Uh, They just feel emotionally incapable of doing so. and so none of this is, is you know, a pleasant experience or, uh, you know, a Machiavellian strategy on the part of mothers. Um, but it might be an evolved strategy for mothers to assess, is investing in this infant um, worthwhile? Um, do we have the resources to do? And that was another big predictor of postpartum depression was lack of money or financial stress. Um, and um, if we don't, now, what we see in a lot of species is we just see mothers abandoning infants. Um, uh, but in humans, um, there's the potential that other folks can step in. We are an alloparenting species, a cooperative breeding species, where we rely heavily uh, on others to help us raise offspring. And so mothers should not just immediately abandon an offspring that they think they can't afford. They should signal genuine need, uh, we argue, via depression, and see if the help that they need is forthcoming. Do people step up and does the, does the mother's family, does the father's family, does the father, do um, siblings, uh, maybe other ch- older children, um, you know, respond. And we, we do see that that's in fact what often happens in many cases is that folks do respond to the mother's depression by providing uh, the more help. So yes, that's how it would apply in the postpartum case. Um, And postpartum depression, a lot of folks study it because um, unlike most depression where 
um, the social triggers you can't predict when they're going to occur. Um, with a pregnancy, you know exactly when that baby's showing up. And so you know exactly when the stressor is going to happen. Um, and so it provides a lot of <coughs> excuse me, research advantages um, that you have a really well-defined um, situation where you can really see um, um, what's going on. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now for the last part of the interview, let's change topics and talk, talk about uh, drug consumption and substance abuse and things like that. So, I mean, there's this sort of paradox of drug reward that, I mean, you've studied this even in more traditional societies like hunter-gatherers, for example, and there seems to be this human propensity to seek out and consume plant neurotoxins. That, that is, if they are neurotoxins, they uh, supposedly are harmful. But uh, so why does this happen? Yeah, so um, this is research I, I'm doing in collaboration with Roger Sullivan um, and several of other my um, uh, graduate students right now. Um, Roger and I, we both met in, in graduate school at uh, UC Santa Barbara, and so we started working on this um, problem um, over 20 years ago now. Um, and the standard story of drug use, um, and we both got into it actually because as we were both interested in mental health from an evolutionary perspective, and one thing you see, especially in schizophrenic patients um, who Roger was studying, but um, across a wide range of, of mental health conditions is really heavy drug use. Um, so we were kind of thinking about what's going on there. Uh, why do we see such heavy drug use in this um, patient samples? Um, and the standard story was that drugs are evolutionarily novel. Um, and so they uh, are able to hijack our reward circuitry and they make us feel good and they lead us uh, then to behaviors consuming more drugs that are ultimately harmful to us. Um, and so this is called the hijack model. And it's very much based on the, on the presumption that drugs are evolutionarily novel because, because drug use has all these um, negative consequences. Um, if it wasn't evolutionarily novel, then um, it shouldn't be able to hijack our, our reward systems and cause us all these harms. So that was kind of the standard story um, that most evolutionary folks and actually mainstream researchers um, in the neurobiology of drug use had adopted. But when we started thinking about it, we said, well, what are most drugs? Um, and with the exception of alcohol, it's, um, if we think about tobacco, cocaine, marijuana, betel nut, coffee, um, they're all plant-based drugs. Yeah. And um, we ask why do plants produce nicotine? Why do they produce THC? Why do they produce cocaine? Well, these are plant defensive chemicals. Uh, nicotine only exists because it successfully harmed and deterred tobacco herbivores. Cocaine only exists uh, because it successfully harmed and deterred uh, coca uh, herbivores. Um, so these drugs are um, only exist because they have the exact opposite effect that was being claimed by the hijack model. Uh, they only um, evolved because they are uh, extremely potent neurotoxins that evolve to harm individuals that are consuming them, not reward them. Mm -hmm. And um, this is not an evolutionary novelty. Um, we have been consuming plants for hundreds of millions of years, and those plants have always contained large quantities of defensive chemicals, including neurotoxins. Um, and so there's no sense in which, as a class anyway, these compounds are remotely evolutionarily novel, um, nor is our body fooled. Everybody who um, smokes their first cigarette uh, feels kind of queasy and sick. So our body immediately recognizes that nicotine and cocaine are neurotoxins. They taste bitter. Um, they stimulate nausea and vomiting and aversive learning. Um, they activate drug metabolizing enzymes and transporters. 
So all of your toxin defense and mechanisms kick into gear um, when you consume any of these drugs. Um, so the question is, and that's what we call the paradox of drug reward. How is it that potent neurotoxins, and actually there's enough nicotine in a pack of cigarettes to kill you within minutes. Um, and so when we think about the harms of tobacco, we're typically thinking about cancer and heart disease that's going to occur um, you know, late in life. Um, but what we don't typically think about is that uh, cocaine and nicotine are substances that evolve to stop your heart and stop your breathing and actually can do that very quickly uh, and often do. There are uh, many, many cases of, of deaths, um, acute deaths from nicotine poisoning. Yeah. So that's what we call the paradox of drug reward. How is it that potent neurotoxins um, that trigger every toxin defense uh, mechanism in the body have these rewarding effects. And we don't see that as an easily resolved um, paradox. Um, we don't think that the simple hijack model um, it really hasn't grappled with the toxicity of these compounds and the significance of the toxicity of these compounds. Um, neurobiological researchers and drug use have long known that that's what these things are, but they never really grappled with it theoretically. So our whole approach is let's grapple with the theoretical implications of these things being extremely toxic and what could then can explain the fact that essentially everybody on the planet uses them in some form or another. Almost everybody transitions to drug use, be it coffee or tea or tobacco or alcohol or marijuana um, in adolescence. <clears throat> and we essentially have, you know, 100% of the population using some psychoactive substance as adults. Um, and we see that across cultures. Um, so what's going on here? <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and we don't know, but one of our main hypotheses is if you look at what these substances evolve to do, they evolve to harm plant parasites and plant pathogens, things that eat plants. Yeah. Well, it turns out the same things that eat plants eat us. And so could it be that um, drug use is a form of self-medication against parasites and pathogens? Um, because we see that same behavior in non-human species, that they deliberately seek out and consume toxic plants to harm their own parasites and their own pathogens. Um, so that's one of our hypotheses that we're pursuing is that humans have actually evolved to deliberately consume small quantities of highly toxic substances as a way to self-medicate against our own parasites and pathogens. Um, it's not the only hypothesis we're considering, um, and we don't have much evidence for that yet, uh, but we think it's a pretty solid um, uh, hypothesis to pursue at this point. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let me just <clears throat> ask you one last question. Uh, are there any major gender differences in tobacco use? And uh, what is the evolutionary rationale for them? Yeah, so one of the first things we started looking at is, is do we see age and sex differences? And it turns out there's huge uh, cross-culturally universal age differences and sex differences. Um, and it was really striking to us that drug use by children is almost non-existent. Um, that, and, and there's you know, huge cross-national studies on the age of onset of the use of tobacco, marijuana, alcohol, cocaine. And in every single study, in every single culture, um, we see virtually no drug use between about the ages of zero and 10. And then between 10 and 20, i.e. adolescence and puberty, there's a very rapid transition to, to drug use in virtually everyone, um, so that by about age 20, everybody's using some psychoactive substance. Um, and what we also then see, as you noted, is a sex difference, that males are using more drugs in general than females, and that is also universal. And we have verified these patterns in a large sample of hunter-gatherers in the Congo Basin, still living a pretty traditional lifestyle. Uh, in that population, where there's not a lot of social controls, kids aren't using tobacco, they're not using marijuana, 
Um, and then there's a rapid transition in the men to tobacco and marijuana use in adolescence so that uh, adult men, about virtually 100% of them are using tobacco and about 70% of them are using marijuana. Um, but there's almost zero tobacco or marijuana use in the women. So what explains these huge sex and age differences? And what we argue is it's the neurotoxicity of these substances that when your brain is developing in childhood, these neurotoxic substances are very teratogenic and they disrupt brain development. Yeah. And so we argue that children have evolved to avoid plant toxins in general and these highly potent neurotoxins in particular. Um, and so that the reason that we don't, and that really is contrary to the hijack model because under the hijack model, these substances are just irresistibly rewarding. And we know that kids love sugar and candy, and so natural substances that trigger the reward circuits, uh, you can't, it's really hard to keep those away from kids. Um, but we don't have any problem keeping them away from these uh, bitter, um, toxic plant substances. Um, so we think that the reason we see this huge age difference is that kids uh, may have evolved to avoid these substances, to avoid disrupting the development of their own nervous systems. Um, and we see that kids are very picky eaters. They don't like green leafy vegetables. Um, it's always a struggle to, to get them to eat their, their vegetables. And we think for the exact same reasons here, that plants are chock full of toxic substances, many of which are teratogens. Now, how does that explain that we see less drug use in adult women? Well, it's the same exact explanation because once um, over our evolutionary history, once women reached about age 18 or 20, they start having kids. And so now they would want to avoid toxic substances, not to protect their own brain development, but the protect um, or prevent any disruption in the brain development of their fetuses. Mm -hmm. And so, and, and to be honest, it was actually an Aka woman, an Aka forager, um, when we were first beginning to research this, and we asked her, you know, how come you guys don't smoke tobacco? And she's like, oh, it's bad for the baby. Um, so, oh, um, so, so the, the women were aware of the effects? They were aware. And they had their own emic explanations. They weren't the Western explanations. Like they said, smoking would um, make the baby cough or it would make the baby black. or So they had these kind of emic um cultural models of harm to the baby, um, but they did have a very strong uh, emic model, as we call it in anthropology, um, you know, an internal cultural model of that using these substances um, when you're pregnant or nursing would be, would be bad for the kids. And so we began then looking at this, how universal is this pattern, and we see that it's extremely universal. And moreover, we can show that um, uh, Reproductive age women are the least likely among adult women to be um, using tobacco, for example, that when they get pregnant, even if they're smokers, uh, their use drops. Um, we've also shown that um, young children in the household are protective against tobacco use in women. Um, so if they have you know, young infants, they're much less likely, or they're nursing, they're much less likely to be using tobacco. Um, and we have shown this across um, large samples, across cultures that we're seeing the same exact pattern over and over and over. Um, and then we also see a pattern that once women reach menopause, their drug use increases. And this was actually known by tobacco researchers, but they didn't have any explanation for it. Why does tobacco use increase um, when women reach uh, 40 or 50 years old? And so our explanation is that once you're postmenopausal, um, there's no risk of disrupting fetal brain development. And so now the benefits, whatever benefits there might be uh, for drug use for men, women can now take advantage of those benefits without paying the costs of disrupted um, fetal development. So that's our working model right now. In fact, that's where we're putting most of our research effort right now is to test the idea um, that it's a, what we call the fetal protection model that the sex difference in drug use um, is largely due to um, evolved adaptations to pr protect your fetuses from um, disruptive development. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, from uh, so from apart uh, apart from what you've just referred to, what are some other projects that you are currently working on? So I guess my other big project is on the evolution of leadership. I'm working on that with my former grad student uh, Zach Garfield, yeah. and this is from an old idea that was published um, back in the '60s and then forgotten. Um, by James Neal, and James Neal uh, was a geneticist who uh, worked closely with Napoleon Chagnon and the, with the Yanomamo and other Amazonian groups, and he was really um, started working with them to uh, really get a handle on what did ancestral uh, patterns of reproduction and demography look like. Um, because he thought we really, these groups are disappearing very, very rapidly, and so we have to kind of work quickly to begin to get some sense of what ancestral conditions might have looked like uh, when it comes to genetics and reproduction. And what he and, and Shagnon found is that headmen had um, way more kids than everybody else. And Neil um, recognized the evolutionary implications of that, that uh, what we would now call male reproductive skew. Um, if you just have a few men um, fathering most of the kids, there's going to be strong sexual selection on whatever trait it is that allows these men to rise to the headman position. Yeah. And so Neil was, what is it about headmen that uh, allows them to have multiple wives, whereas other men do not? and therefore multiple kids or large families. And what he proposed is um, these guys are smart. Um, they are able to rise to their headmanship position um, because they are some of the smartest guys um, in the group and everybody looks to them uh, for their skills and talents. So he had uh, an early sexual selection hypothesis for the evolution of intelligence. Uh, and when I stumbled across this idea, I thought, wow, that's a really great idea. I'm kind of shocked nobody has kind of pursued that idea. Um, and so we've picked up Neil's idea and started to uh, kind of, because he never explained what is it about intelligence that gets you into the leadership position? Why is it attractive to females? He kind of just noticed that this, this pattern, but he didn't really explain how it would work. Um, and I think one problem with his theory is when we see strong sexual selection on a trait in men, we typically see sexual dimorphism. Mm -hmm. um, so his theory might predict that you'd have sexually dimorphic intelligence, um, but we don't see that. We see that males and females are equally intelligent. Um, and so I think that's kind of what's evidence against um, a, sec a pure kind of classic sexual selection argument for the uh, evolution of intelligence. Um, and so that led us to think what could be going on here in men and women um, and leadership and reproductive success, um, how does this all tie together? And so what our working hypothesis is right now is that um, people are, that what it means to be a leader is to make good decisions for the group. Yeah. And if you dig into decision theory um, you find that the computational problems of making good decisions for yourself are really overwhelming. Um, in fact, um, it looks you know just like that the the amount of computational resources you would need to optimize your own decisions would be vast. Um, and so this has led to a lot of work on simple heuristics and, and things like this. Um, but we say, okay, however computationally difficult it would be to make good decisions for yourself, what about making good decisions not only for yourself but everybody else? That's got to be even exponentially more complex. And so what we argue is that the, the reason that intelligence and leadership are linked is that making good decisions that everybody else in the group will buy into is extremely computationally complex. You've got to consider all these conflicts of interest and all these options um, and so it really takes a huge amount of computation to do that well. Um, and so that's why there might be, um, why leaders might be smart. 
Um, but now why is there sexual selection on that? Um, and we began thinking about that, and we realized that leading the group is not much different from leading a family. Mm -hmm. um, you've still got to make a lot of decisions for all the people in the family, um, and so it would be very attractive to mates to have somebody that can make good decisions at the family level, not just the group level. And when we began thinking about that, we said, well, who is typically leading these families? It's often not men, it's women. It's women having to make all these computations about what kids should be doing what, when, where, who. And so where we are right now is that a lot of the sexual selection, if you will, on leadership abilities was actually selection on women um, leading large families. Because if you look at what's the major difference between chimpanzees and families and human families, chimpanzee mothers are caring for one infant at a time. They um, have very long periods of dependence, about four years, um, and then they have another kid, whereas human mothers have a much more rapid uh, reproductive rate of one kid about every two, two and a half years, maybe every three years, and we have a much longer development period. So what we see in human families, unlike chimpanzee families, is that mothers are simultaneously having to care for and make decisions for cognitively immature, a large number of cognitively immature individuals. And that this was an extraordinarily computationally demanding task. So this is kind of where we are right now is, is that maybe what was really going on was the evolution of leadership abilities in women having to make decisions for multiply, multiple cognitively immature individuals, good decisions, and having to do that minute after minute, hour after hour, day after day, year after year. Um, so anyway, that's some of the, the stuff we're, other stuff we're working on right now. Okay, great. And uh, where can people find your work on the internet? Uh, if you just Google Ed Hagen, uh, you'll find my web page at WSU. So that would be, and I have all my papers listed there. So uh, yeah, just Google Ed Hagen and, and you'll find me pretty quickly. Okay, great. So let's end the interview here, Dr. Hagen. It was a real pleasure again to have you on the show and I really love the conversation and maybe sometime in the future where when you're more advanced on that uh, work or project on the evolutionary models of leadership, maybe we could have another one. I don't know. Yeah, that would be great. Thanks for having me. Hello everybody, thank you for watching this interview until the end. As you might have noticed, I've been putting out regular interviews with leading intellectuals from around the world. And so, to keep the channel sustainable, I would really like to ask you to please visit my Patreon page and to consider making a pledge there. Otherwise, and if you like what I'm doing, please share it, leave a like and hit the subscription button. You can also support me via PayPal. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my patrons Karen Litzke, Anne Blanchett, Pereira Larsen, Lau Guerrero, Chantal Gilinas, Francis Ford, Hans Friedrich Sunda, Brian Rivera, Sergio Condriano, Yane Henninen, Ricardo Vladimiro, Craig Healy, Adam Castle, Vega Gidi, Olaf Alex, Jonathan Wiesel, David Diaz, Anian Kata, Jacob Klinkby, Matthew Whittingbird, Arno Wolf, Tim Hollacy, Henrik Alenius, John Connors, Drs. Jerry Mueller, Herbert Gintis, Rutger Voss, and Bo Weingard, my four producers, Isar Webbe, Rosie, Jim Frank, and Lucas Stafiniak, and my executive producer, Michel Ruzieski. Thank you for all.